environmental law covers a lot of areas of law. So both in common law and civil law, um, environmental law arises in areas such as tort law, property law, food laws we've talked about, but also things you might not immediately think about. So corporate law, trade law have huge impact on how the environment is protected or degraded, intellectual property law. So there's, in fact, very few areas of law that are not affecting or affected by the environment. And then, of course, there's the international level of law where Canada has obligations under, for example, the Paris Climate Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals. Welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast. This podcast series tackles some of the big questions in the field of environmental politics for university students in Canada. I'm Peter Andre from Carleton University, and my co-host for the series is Ryan Katz-Rosine from the University of Ottawa, though he's not going to join us for today's conversation. In this episode, I'll be talking with Dr. Heather McLeod Kilmurray, professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa, and Dr. Angela Lee, assistant professor of law at Ryerson University in Toronto. Today, we're talking about environmental law and policy in Canada. Both Heather and Angela teach courses on the intersection between Canadian law and the environment. They are also two of the three co-editors with Professor Nathalie Chalifour of the University of Ottawa of a groundbreaking book released in 2019 called Food Law and Policy in Canada. Environmental law and policy, as we'll discuss, encompasses a lot. Uh, This is also a rapidly changing field as the climate crisis and biodiversity crises deepen, as new issues like plastics in the environment come into the political spotlight, and as new technologies like lab-grown meat or genetically modified fish come into supply chains and need to be regulated for their possible environmental and human health implications. I'm so glad that we have two experts with us today, Heather and Angela, to help us unpack environmental law and policy in the Canadian context. We have a lot of territory to cover, so I think we should just get right into it. So thank you both for joining me in this conversation. And I'm going to start with a question for Heather to set the stage. Heather, how would you characterize the field of environmental law in general terms? And what does this field look like in Canada specifically? So first and foremost, there are and always have been Indigenous nations in Canada with extensive environmental laws, principles and practices. Uh, While some settler law and practice is starting to acknowledge and respect traditional knowledge, science, and expertise, it's still woefully inadequate in this regard. Uh, Indigenous environmental law on these lands and waters, of course, deserves an entire podcast of their own and indeed many and varied ones. Um, Within Canadian settler law, uh, we can begin with Canada's constitution, um, which does not, interestingly, include the environment as one of the areas of jurisdiction given either exclusively to the federal government or the provincial government. So we have a shared jurisdiction over the environment that's often debated. And a classic example of this is the current uh, litigation over the Federal Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, or over the the carbon pricing uh, efforts of the federal government. So section 91 and 92 of the Constitution divide federal and provincial powers over various undertakings, so the province has power over things like property and civil rights, matters of a local and private nature, and natural resources, while the federal government has power over things like fisheries, taxation, interprovincial trade. But the federal government also has a basket category called um, peace, order, and good government. And that POG power contains a national concern doctrine, and that was the argument Uh, that the federal government was able to win on in both the litigation in Ontario and Saskatchewan, but the Alberta Court of Appeal disagreed, and so now it's going to the Supreme Court of Canada. So what most experts argue is that we have, of course, an overlapping jurisdiction over the environment, and and, uh, we would apply normally what Canada tends to do, which is a cooperative federalism model. Also, of course, municipal governments have a lot of environmental power and influence through things like planning law, zoning, infrastructure, transportation policy, etc. You've 
done a great job, Heather, of kind of sketching the breadth of environmental law and policy, recognizing the place of indigenous uh, environmental law and policy, which is still under acknowledged by the state, and then talking about this area of overlapping jurisdiction and hopefully cooperative federalism in, in most cases. Can you tell me a little bit about the normative assumptions that underpin uh, this legal approach? Yes. Yeah, so, while there is some movement lately toward more ecocentric and ecosystem type approaches in some areas of Canadian environmental law, a lot of emphasis is still on the environmental benefits to humans. So it's still quite anthropocentric. There is growing awareness that there can't really be an economy without an environment. However, the original views of settler societies that natural resources are to be exploited for gain remain strong. Um, for example, the new federal pan-Canadian framework on climate change is still called the framework on clean growth and climate change. So still this idea that constant growth is a fundamental, seemingly unassailable primary goal is a real challenge for achieving sustainability. So anthropocentrism, extractivism, capitalism, we st a lot of emphasis on sort of the ability of Western science and technology to solve a lot of problems. So in Canada, environmental law has often been criticized as just a system of permits and controlling. That's uh, That was really the model we used in the 60s and 70s, rather than trying to prevent all environmental degradation. And so some have even called for us to stop talking about environmental law and stop doing environmental law and move to more sort of paradigm shifting concepts such as ecological law or green law, earth law things of that nature. That's really fascinating, uh, Heather, just um, as you point out some of those normative assumptions that I think many lawyers and many of us just take for granted and that within this field of environmental law uh, deservedly are going to be criticized. And, and uh, it's exciting to think about where this whole field can go in the future. And I think I'll ask you some questions about that at the very end. Um, but right now, I would like to turn to, to Angela. Angela, Heather has provided a really good, broad introduction to what environmental law looks like in Canada. Can you give us some examples of some of Canada's key pieces of federal environmental legislation and how they are meant to manage or protect the environment? What are their key instruments, enforcement mechanisms that are found in this legislation? And to what extent does this legislation actually achieve its goals? Right. So there are definitely a lot of different pieces of legislation that we could look at, as Heather has already identified, all of our lives and our health and our societies and our economies and so on are ultimately contingent on having a healthy and functioning environment. And so in many ways, we can look at all law as sort of being environmental law in a sense. But there are some specific areas, um, some specific federal pieces of environmental legislation, of course, that we can identify and we can identify some sort of some broad categories that these fall under. So, for example, pollution prevention was a, a major sort of area of environmental law growth in its earliest days in sort of the 60s and the 70s. And there are acts that are concerned specifically with things like air quality and water quality. So, for example, in the Fisheries Act, there are provisions that deal with issues that relate to water pollution within the ambit of this legislation. And then we also have acts that are concerned with the regulation of toxic and dangerous substances. There are acts that deal with biodiversity and conservation. So probably the most uh, significant act in that area is the Species at Risk Act. There are also other acts like those that are specific to the Arctic. Um, there's the Federal Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act that Heather has already made reference to. There's an Impact Assessment Act that focuses on major projects that take place within federal jurisdiction and then the environmental effects of, of those kinds of major projects. But probably the most significant piece of environmental legislation in Canada is the Canadian Environmental Protection Act 1999. And so this is kind of the cornerstone of Canada's federal environmental legislation. And broadly speaking, CEPA 1999, as it's called, is aimed at preventing pollution and protecting the environment and human health from the adverse effects of toxic substances. So essentially it creates a regulatory system 
to identify sources of pollution and waste, and then to control the quantity and quality of these substances that are discharged into the environment. So it provides some processes for assessing these kinds of substances with respect to the risks that they might pose to environmental and human health. And interestingly, SIPA also makes an explicit reference to sustainable development as an aspiration. So it alludes to sustainable development in its preamble. And sustainable development, as some listeners may be familiar with to varying degrees, is the most influential discursive norm in modern environmental law today. And the definition that most people think of when they think of sustainable development is that which was proposed in the Brundtland Report um, that was uh, published in 1987. And so this talks about development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And so that's also been sort of an underpinning idea of a lot of pieces of Canadian environmental legislation, including SIPA and a number of other acts as well. So moving on to kind of the second part of your question about enforcement, there is a standalone Environmental Enforcement Act. This was part of an omnibus legislation that came into force in 2010, uh, created some new enforcement tools, it amended some fine regimes, and introduced sentencing provisions to nine existing acts. And the underlying goal here was to promote more effective enforcement of the laws that protect Canada's national parks, air, land, water, and wildlife. Uh, there's also an Environmental Violations Administrative Monetary Penalties Act, and this establishes a framework for issuing administrative monetary penalties for violations of the legislation. So these are, these are fines that companies and individuals can be charged with. But one of the major problems in terms of Canadian environmental law and policy is that a lot of these acts are not often framed in mandatory terms. And so officials are authorized to develop regulations, and often there are regulations that are in place but they don't necessarily have strong positive obligations to act. And they're also afforded a significant degree of discretion. So ultimately this often creates a situation where legislators are addressing the symptoms of environmental degradation in a more reactive fashion, as opposed to targeting some of the root causes more proactively. And so while this means that environmental law has had its share of successes, there's still a lot of progress that can and must be made if we're going to ensure a viable future. So as Heather has already suggested, there are some really deeply rooted systemic issues that need to be addressed in terms of this constant preoccupation with growth, um, with growth of the economy, uh, growing consumption from um, individual consumers and so on. So while there's been increasing talk about the importance of addressing these issues, and while I think there's been more appetite to take these kinds of things on, on the political level, uh, many would argue that we haven't necessarily seen enough action. And Peter, as you already mentioned, we are seeing in terms of metrics like climate change and with biodiversity loss, we are increasingly sort of on the precipice of a global ecological crisis. So this is certainly something that uh, I think we're going to need to see a lot stronger law and policy on in the future. Thanks, Angela. That was a pretty comprehensive overview of uh, a lot of the key instruments. And uh, <clears throat> it's interesting that you mentioned uh, the, the SEPA in particular as one of our key pieces of environmental legislation. I understand that's currently being reviewed by the government as part of a, a regular review cycle to see whether it's doing what it should be doing and how it needs to be updated. And uh, and then your your final points around the ecological crisis we're in, clearly um, it's not only in Canada, but globally, there, there's, uh, there are many environmental problems for which our legal frameworks and policy frameworks are still not doing enough. And given this context, I just wonder, I'll turn it to you, Heather. If our environmental laws are not always effective as they need to be, as effective as they need to be, what are the processes in place to ensure that these laws and regulations become more effective in the future? So you mentioned the revisions to the Environmental Protection Act. That's that's exactly right. We are in that process. So to be technical, Section 343 of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act 1999 itself it makes it a legal requirement to um, report and review uh, to Parliament uh, the administration of the Act every five years. So the most recent review began in 2016 
and the Standing Committee on Environment and Sustainable Development undertook a study and it heard written and in-person submissions from a very wide range of people and groups and stakeholders, including many academics. And it submitted a report in 2017. And then the government responded to that with its own report later in tw- about six months later, and then a follow-up report in 2018. So that happens every five years and recommendations are made to make improvements to the act or to regulations pursuant to the act or to various policies uh, for implementing it. In this particular series of uh, this particular five-year cycle revision, there was a lot of emphasis on environmental rights and whether that was sort of a paradigm through which SEPA 1999 should be understood, should be implemented, uh, etc. Um, so those reports are all uh, available online in terms of how we're progressing there. Another sort of institution is that we have at the federal level a commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development under the Office of the Auditor General. And that commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development issues regular reports, which are kind of what they themselves call performance audits on the environment and sustainable development um, achievements of the federal government. And so this commissioner is supposed to provide objective, independent analysis and recommendations about how the federal government is doing in terms of environmental protection. Um, And so they monitor sustainable development strategies. They, They do targeted reports on particular issues, for example. Another thing that that commissioner is responsible for is the environmental petitions process. So under that process, any individual or group can Uh, bring a petition to the commissioner and the commissioner will assess the petition uh, forward petitions that they think are viable to whichever department um, is responsible for the issue being complained about. And then the minister responsible will issue a response. And so those responses and petitions can be made public online. And then the commissioner also reports to parliament every year about that whole petitions process. So that's another tool that's there in terms of um, monitoring and reporting and hopefully leading to improvement. There's similar structures at the provincial levels as well. And then, of course, you have the role of civil society. Uh, So the civil society can provide input on these legislative reviews. Um, There are things like under the Ontario Environmental Bill of Rights, there's also opportunities for participation in various tools of enforcement We have organizations like EcoJustice that litigate environmental issues in the public interest that sometimes can try to require the government to take further steps or to improve on its performance. Uh, And in terms of access to information for civil society, we have environmental registries uh, at both the federal and provincial levels. And so, of course, we also have litigation in administrative law or tort law or in other areas to try to challenge um, if, if, if people are of the view that laws or standards or permits are inadequate or are leading to unacceptable pollution. Hopefully, we like to think that academia also has some role to play in terms of uh, critically appraising uh, our, the various uh, regulatory regimes and behaviors um, of governments in Canada. Uh, and so those are just a few of the tools that are available. Thanks, Heather. That's really interesting. Um, you mentioned the this idea of environmental rights in the SEPA of 1999, as at least as it's coming up in the review process as something that maybe should be considered as part of the SEPA. Can you say a little bit more about that? What what do environmental rights mean in this context? No, well, that's a really good question. And so basically, the fundamental idea is that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms protects all kinds of rights of Canadians, but we don't actually have a right to a clean environment in Canada. Now, I should say that the Quebec Charter of Rights and Freedoms does provide um, environmental rights, but at the federal level, the federal charter does not, whereas hundreds of other countries do, in fact, um, uh, include environmental rights, even in their constitutions in some cases. So Professor David Boyd has done an extensive analysis of that constitutional environmental rights in other countries and their level of effectiveness in actually improving uh, environmental protection. 
So there have been various um, attempts. For example, the David Suzuki Foundation had the Blue Dot program in an effort to try to get um, environmental rights included. One tool can be an environmental bill of rights at the federal level, similar to the one in Ontario. Of course, the some argue that we should actually revise the charter to include an express right to the environment. And then, um, then there's some debate about how that, even if we were willing to do that, how would that right be framed? Should it be that human beings have a right to live in a clean and healthy environment, for example, or should it be that the government has a duty to provide a clean environment for humans? And then going even further in some constitutions in other countries, it's nature itself that has a right. So Mother Earth has a right to exist and to, and to, to remain sustainable, for example, and it's humans that owe legal duties to the planet. So these are some of the very interesting issues in the realm of environmental rights that are being discussed right now. So as I understand it, we're going from a fairly narrow conception of environmental rights around which a lot of this legislation is currently based that assumes you you are a specific type of being that is uh, impacted by whatever negative activity is going on and thereby have a a right to intervene. And often that's a fairly fairly narrow group of uh, people or corporations right now. Um, And and then of the options you mentioned, some are still anthropocentric, but allowing a much wider group of the public to be able to claim and assert their environmental rights. And, And But some of these options are really about moving in a more ecocentric direction by allowing uh, rivers or forests or uh, nature as a whole to uh, have be seen as a right holder. So that's really interesting. That's right. So, I mean, some such as my colleague Linda Collins and many others have argued that the Charter of Rights, for example, the right to life and security in Section 7 should be read to include a right to the environment because with the increasing crisis of climate change that can affect our security and ultimately even our life. Some have argued Section 15, in some litigation there has been an attempt to argue Section 15, which is equality rights, which talks about environmental justice, that some some people um, are subject to environmental harms to a much greater degree than others. So that's an equality problem. And then, of course, there are Indigenous rights in Section 35 that can also be used um, in some cases to protect the environment. And then, as you said, some jurisdictions have given rights to rivers um, or to particular pieces of the ecosystem. So there's lots of variety. The overview you provided of the various mechanisms whereby legislation uh, gets reviewed is was really interesting to me. And um, and then you, of course, mentioned uh, the, the legal mechanisms through uh, uh, litigation and that there are, are civil society groups like Eco Justice that you mentioned that actively uh, try and advance environmental law in Canada by very selective and uh, litigation to to strengthen environmental law. Uh, what you didn't mention, but I think it's worth mentioning given we're speaking to mostly political science and political studies students, is of course um, the role that uh, a new legislation can play and the the role that uh, parliamentarians um, and the whole parliamentary system can play in in uh, introducing new tools uh, moving forward into the future. Yes, absolutely. So there there was a very interesting case, the Kyoto Protocol Implementation Act, and that's a very interesting story that students may have time to explore, where um, uh, a backbencher had proposed this legislation, the Kyoto Protocol Implementation Act, that c- made it an enforceable duty on the government to meet its Kyoto targets during the Harper government years. Um, and amazingly, it was passed through both houses. Um, and then when, of course, the government did not comply, there was immediate litigation in relation to that. And then the legislation was ultimately repealed by the Harper majority government. So that's a very interesting story of the interlinkages between politics and law. Great. And speaking about uh, politics and law, I would like to pose a question to you, Angela. Environmental law has clearly evolved over time with legislation being introduced or updated over time. And the the Kyoto Implementation Act is a really good example of that. 
I wonder if you can give us a general sense of how conservative versus liberal governments in Canada have approached the implementation and enforcement of environmental legislation over time. Are governments of one political stripe greener than the other, or does this depend more on the context of the times they are governing, or maybe it's some other factors? Right. So this concept of sustainable development, as we've already discussed, and balancing these kind of three pillars of environment, economy, and society can and has been interpreted in some very different ways. And so, unfortunately, economic growth and environmental degradation under the current political and economic system that we live within are quite closely connected. And so with some governments that have been much more bullish about economic growth, environmental degradation has kind of has kind of been a necessary side effect. Uh, but ultimately, people in power oftentimes have a vested interest in upholding the status quo, which means that both liberal and conservative governments have an interest in continued growth and profit making, and that is reflected in their environmental records. And so cuts to environmental programs have been made under both liberal and conservative governments. So there certainly isn't one one of the major political parties in Canada in, in any case that has been visibly superior to the other. And uh, as, as you've already sort of mentioned, this, this does kind of differ depending on the context of the times that they are governing within. And so as we're seeing now, much more of a public concern about the environment, it seems far less likely that any government, regardless of their partisan affiliation or whatnot, uh, would be able to get away with running on a platform that doesn't consider issues like climate change, issues like biodiversity to some extent. Uh, but unfortunately, Canada is also operating in a particular context because extractive industries, things like agriculture, mining, oil and gas and so on, have historically been a significant part of Canada's economy. And even though they might not necessarily be as important to Canada's GDP anymore, they, they do continue to exert a significant degree of political influence. And I think that this is something that we have historically seen as well. And this is something that emerges a lot in sort of the food and agriculture space, the power of the agribusiness lobbies. And this is something that I think is going to increasingly be a political issue that is on the agenda. Um, developments at the international level can also provide an impetus for domestic action. So things like the World Commission on the Environment and Development and various other kinds of United Nations efforts have stimulated developments in Canadian domestic law. And we have seen some progress in this respect, both domestically and internationally. So one of the major sort of wins for environmental law that people often go back to is the 1987 Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer. So there was a point in time when we were quite concerned about this ozone hole that we were seeing. And this protocol did go a long way towards addressing that issue and reversing the harm that we had caused. So that that is kind of a, a win that, that we have seen in terms of environmental law. Um, but long story short, federal interest in environmental issues does sort of fluctuate and change in character depending on the context and depending on the particular people that are in power and what else is going on at the time. So environmental laws and policies and, and action on such policies as well usually tracks with broader public concerns with respect to the environment as well as the government's overall economic agenda. So these are two pieces that are quite significant in terms of shaping the direction of environmental law and policy and action on environmental issues. Um, and so we can see this in the context of some contemporary issues that are very timely. And I think that right now we're at something of a pivotal moment. So we've seen these pipeline protests in Canada in the early part of 2020. Um, with respect to the construction of the coastal gasoline pipeline through the unceded territory of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation in BC. And that, that was quite significant in terms of the impact that that had, those protests had. Climate change is obviously a hot topic issue that is going to continue to be a political issue. And the associated litigation that is coming out of that, both in Canada and in other countries around the world, um, the COVID context has also been illuminating both at the federal level and then at the provincial level, there have been a number of significant developments as well. So 
Doug Ford's government in Ontario suspended a number of environmental protections in April, citing the argument that these kinds of environmental protections could slow down the pandemic response. And many people were very concerned about those rollbacks. The government did revoke some of those changes in June alongside the economic reopening of the province, but it was kind of an ominous time. Um, and similar things are happening across the border with the Trump government and environmental rollbacks there. And more broadly, the Ford government has been uh, identified as one of the most damaging provincial governments in terms of the environment and things like that. So ultimately, the politics do matter. But uh, there are a, a lot of other forces at play as well. So far, we've been talking about environmental legislation, mainly as set by the federal government in Canada. Now, what are we typically referring to when we speak about environmental policy? And how is this the same or different from environmental law? Heather, I wonder if you can speak to this. So, I mean, in a very, very technical sense, sometimes people div- dis- divide law and policy that, in the sense that law can be limited to legislation and regulations pursuant to it, or case law, um, as well as international treaties, for example. That would be very, very technical approach to what's law versus policy can generally be broader. But of course, policies lead to legislation as well, or uh, laws can be the embodiment of policy goals as well. So there is a very close link. Um, But When we talk about policy, we can broaden it out to um, what's sometimes referred to as the broader policy toolbox. So it can include things like the budget, the federal budget. It can is obviously a policy tool and greatly influences how much of uh, a piece of legislation gets enforced, uh, whether regulations come into effect, whether enforcement takes place and is effective, etc., um, policies like the climate change policy, as re- as reflected in, as we've mentioned several times today already, the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change. So this is a policy uh, framework that the Trudeau government put into place to try to enhance uh, collaboration on tackling climate change across the country through all of the jurisdictions. Other things that can fall in, under the policy umbrella are things like guidelines and standards. Some of these are not legally enforceable, but they're very frequently used to try to achieve certain environmental goals or behaviors. Uh, other things are administrative arrangements. So even under the legislation, uh, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act 1999 does allow for administrative arrangements so that federal, uh, provincial actors can agree ahead of time how to administer something or work sharing arrangements in order to make inspections and environmental assessments more uh, streamlined, more effective, more um, uh, sort of less cumbersome, for example. Then you can also talk about other market-based mechanisms. So I mentioned the budget, but there's also things like taxes, uh, emission trading schemes, investment policies that favor green or production, or green technologies, etc. cetera. Um, so those are some of the types of policy uh, tools that go beyond strict legislation or, or case law, uh, more technically legal enforceable things. And a lot of environmental behavior in Canada is guided by these policy tools. Cool. Angela, I'd also like to ask you a question about how environmental law and policy changes over time. In your research, you've considered how Canada responds to emerging technologies to ensure that they are safe for Canadians and protect the Canadian environment. Can you provide an example of such technologies coming through innovation pipelines and how Canada's laws and policies respond to new technologies? Do we have a system that's adequately prepared to deal with constantly evolving technology? Yes. So this has been a major topic of my research in the past few years, particularly in the context of novel foods. So new technologies and new innovations that are being developed in the context of food and agriculture. And there are some specific applications that I've looked at quite closely, one of which is genetically uh, engineered animals, so with particular reference to the aqua-advantaged salmon, which is a genetically engineered 
salmon that has been approved for consumption by regulators in both Canada and in the United States. So that happened a couple of years ago. And then I've also looked closely at in vitro meat, lab grown meat, clean meat. It's referred to by a number of different names in the literature. But this example is more hypothetical in the sense that although there are a number of companies that are working quite intensely on research and development and hoping to bring their products to market quite soon, uh, many of them have timelines projected as early as this year and next year. They still are not yet a commercial reality. And so I've looked at the existing regulatory framework around novel foods and how this might apply to uh, products of cellular agriculture, but that's still a little bit of an unknown. So in terms of my response to this question and in terms of a more concrete response, I'll talk a little bit more about the aqua advantage salmon. So this is something that people are often surprised to learn about, which I think points to a major problem, which is that there were a number of significant stakeholder groups that were left out of the conversation or just totally not consulted in terms of the approval process of this development. And this certainly isn't something that was kind of rushed through. So this is a, a development that has been in the pipeline for quite some time. And from the company's perspective, I think they would say that they've had to jump through a lot of bureaucratic hoops to get this product to market. And yet I think there are a number of really significant gaps. So first is that sort of public input and public participation component. So from sort of a democratic governance perspective alone, I think there's issues there. But then also from the perspective of environmental and human health considerations, there isn't yet a robust regulatory framework to ensure that these products are safe for the environment, very broadly speaking, and also safe for human health, also broadly construed and over a long time period. So right now, the regulatory framework that governs genetically engineered animals, genetically modified animals, is very kind of ad hoc. And although it makes sure that these things are not toxic, that they don't pose allergy concerns. So according to the regulatory review, Health Canada says functionally the genetically engineered salmon is equivalent to just a regular salmon that you would buy in the in the supermarket. But again, this is along very specific and narrow metrics like toxicology, allergenicity, and so on. And there are many people that have pointed pointed to the fact that there are a lot of other considerations that we should be looking at. So things like the economic impact to Canada's fishermen and so on. And then uh, also in terms of impacts to Indigenous people, many for whom salmon is an important part of their cultural heritage and uh, Indigenous groups were not consulted on the approval process when it comes to the Aqua Vantage salmon. And then, of course, the environmental impact as well. So the Aqua Vantage salmon is actually grown out in land based aquaculture facilities. So they aren't grown out in open water, which the company argues mitigates concerns related to uh, release into open waters and interbreeding with wild fish populations and so on, which would be a major cause for concern. But that just because the risks are mitigated to a significant extent does not mean that the risks are not there. And so this essentially comes down to what kind of appetite uh, of risk we have for these kinds of products and these kinds of developments, and then who gets to have a say in that process. So in my research, these are some of the concerns that I pointed to when it comes to the regulatory framework that exists right now for these kinds of food innovations. And then just more broadly speaking, I would argue that technologies are not a silver bullet. And right now, a lot of the rhetoric that we're seeing around technology and innovation seems to suggest that new technologies and these new innovations can kind of leapfrog over a lot of the really deeply rooted social and economic and political problems that are kind of at the core of the situation that we find ourselves in. And certainly there are a lot of examples that we can point to historically of technologies that have made really grandiose promises and then have not lived up to the expectations. And indeed, many of them have caused problems that were not anticipated from the outset. So I think we need to be really careful about relying on technologies to solve some of these really systemic problems that we're facing. Uh, and not only not only because of the problems that they can cause, but also because these this reliance on technology can stymie the imagination and development of alternatives. So alternative pathways that might be 
less lucrative from a financial standpoint, but that might be more realistic, that might be more feasible, that might have um, less risks, that might have less impacts to groups that are marginalized and so on and so forth. That's a really interesting answer, Angela, and I think it opens up a lot of different questions and avenues of exploration for our listeners who want to get into these issues. Uh, I, I think the points you're raising about how the, the, the place that technology figures in, in our culture where we assume that the solutions, say, to the climate crisis or biodiversity crisis are going to lie in technology and technological innovation um, is, uh, is in itself something that I think deserves some careful careful rethinking as we think about environmental politics as a whole. And I, I also wanted to uh, just connect something that you said with with a point Heather made right off the top when she talked about the, the anthropocentric normative bias within our policy and legal systems. And we see it again in the case of this GM salmon where, uh, yes, there are some really important uh, environmental and potential health implications for, for people cultural implications, as you mentioned, Indigenous people, and I, I would argue maybe most of BC sees that salmon is uh, such an important cultural uh, artifact for all its people. Um, and, and then there's the question of what does this mean for the salmon themselves? And I think this this is getting into that sort of more ecocentric direction that Heather was talking about. Uh, I'll just mention a book that I've been reading this summer called Being Salmon, Being Human by Martin Lee Mueller, which uh, really tries to explore what the salmon in aquaculture industry as a whole, never mind GM salmon, uh, might look like and mean from the point of view of the salmon themselves. And uh, you know, there's a there are fascinating species that are connected to the, you know, the, the our the core of our planet electromagnetically in ways that humans don't have a sense of, literally a sense of, and uh, and it's really interesting in some of this current work to see how what it means to think in a different way about the the more than human rather than this kind of narrow environment as a place of resources and tools for people. Um, I'd like to close by giving you each a chance to mention any final challenges or issues or opportunities that you think students interested in environmental law and policy in Canada should be tuned into. Where do you see this field going into the future? And what would you encourage your students to be paying attention to as they think about the remainder of their education or the next steps in their careers? I'll pass it over to you first, Heather. Great. Um, so I think that uh, some of the challenges that we see are, are issues of enforcement, issues of cumulative effects being taken into account, um, this idea of the non-regression principle so that you know once we have environmental laws that we can increase and improve them, but we can't go backwards and repeal them. This is a big uh, principle that's being discussed in international environmental law and that's actually quite relevant um, in Canada. For example, some of the repeals of legislation in Ontario that have recently occurred and the litigation going on in relation to that. So those are some areas that people are aware need um, a lot of work. Um, Critics of the system, so David Boyd wrote a book called Unnatural Law several years ago where he sort of diagnosed Canadian environmental law and then provided prescriptions for it. And as, as Angela mentioned, he said that, there, of course, it's really important to be an optimistic environmentalist, which is another one of David Boyd's books. And he says that we have environmental law has helped with ozone depletion, protected areas, some kinds of air and water pollution, but that it's still – hasn't done what uh, people like Michael McGonigal from University of Victoria have called for in his green legal theory, which is to really tackle uh, liberal democracy, to tackle or at least unpack, you know, globalized capitalism and see the patterns of production and consumption um, that are at the heart of all of this. And and this idea, too, that envi traditional environmental law has really relied on the government to legislate to solve everything as opposed to a more um, multi-participant, multi-layered approach to trying to resolve all these sort of underpinning issues. Um, so in terms of, of going forward for students, I think it's just important to realize that hopefully whatever 
uh, undertaking you engage in whatever roles or positions you have in the future, it's very likely that it will somehow affect or be affected by the environment. So trying to understand all the multifactorial aspects of sustainable development and all that's required, um, that so taking a broad education, so not just staying within narrow environmental law, but understanding issues of the economy, understanding corporations, understanding global injustice and distributional unfairness, all of these things are going to be important in trying to make the systemic changes that we need. So I think these broad and interlinked ways of learning are really important for people who are trying to be uh, agents of change. Those are great points, uh, Heather. I the idea that the law doesn't act on itself, right, and and uh, or in itself, and and is part of a broader uh, social mores and um, political uh, changes, and so there's many ways to uh, work to affect change, and you need to understand the economy and what how change can happen within the economy in order to think about law and vice versa. Um, I should also add that. Uh, that those uh, books you mentioned, David Boyd's books and uh, Michael McGonigal, we'll make sure that uh, we have them sort of in a little bibliography attached to this this podcast. Great. There's another really fun one that, that Michael McGonigal wrote called Planet U, which is about the role of universities specifically in achieving sustainable development, which is a really fun read. Yes, I, I read that uh, book years ago and was very inspired to uh, think about how changes within our institutions can, uh, you know, represent larger changes in society that we'd like to see. And, and it's maybe a sphere that we're, we, those of us in these institutions, can act, uh, act in more quickly. Angela, I'd like to turn to you. Do you have any uh, final thoughts on challenges, issues, opportunities students who are interested in this area might be, uh, be thinking about or that you encourage them to think about? Yes. So I would like to build on the discussion that we were just having about the role of institutions and the role of education and so on. And I would also like to try to end on an optimistic and positive note, despite being something of a cynic myself. So for me, I became really interested in environmentalism when I was an undergraduate student myself. And this is something that I've obviously carried through into a career at this point. And so it's really encouraging for me to see other young people becoming engaged in these issues so early on. We're seeing so much momentum for change and just so much more enthusiasm for a different kind of future that's really being led by young people, which I think is so great and so encouraging. And so I continue all of you to keep fighting the good fight and do all of that really significant work that I think is making a real a real difference and is is really important to ensure that we build a better kind of future for everyone. And as a racialized woman myself, it's also really encouraging for me to see the environmental movement diversify. So there have been charges laid against environmentalism that it's tended to reflect a very particular point of view. And Unfortunately, I think in many ways that is still the case, but right now there are cracks forming as well, especially as we see the sort of resurgence of these intersectional movements like the Black Lives Matter movement, this greater and growing recognition of environmental perspectives and the value of Indigenous points of view, and also a greater recognition of the harms that have been done by stellar colonialism and the things that we need to do as a Canadian society to recognize those harms and to try to do better in the future. And then also environmental justice is another topic that I hope you're going to take on in a separate episode in a little bit more depth. So environmental justice and environmental racism, there's been more attention paid to that. So there are a number of different projects out of various institutions. So we have the environmental justice in Canada research project based at the University of Ottawa that Heather and I are working on as well as Professor Natalie Chalifour and Professor Sophie Thériault. And then there's also the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project that's based out of York University. And then a lot of important work that's come out of other institutions as well, like Ingrid Waldron, who's in, who's a professor in the School of Nursing at Dalhousie. She wrote a book that was published in 2018 called There's Something in the Water that looks at environmental racism and environmental justice issues in Nova Scotia, specifically 
And then that was also the subject of a 2019 documentary that Ellen Page was involved with. So that's gotten some media attention and generated um, some, some more attention to these issues more broadly, which I think is really important. Thanks so much, uh, Angela. I think those are all really great points. And uh, we will also put some of the links to uh, the, the Environmental Justice in Canada project and some of the other uh, uh, things that you're mentioning. Ingrid Waldron's work, I'm also really impressed with. Uh, and it's been very impactful in Nova Scotia and been such important work on uh, the connections between uh, race and environment. Um, so I, and we will bring this up into future episodes. Uh, just one last thing that I think might be fun to follow just in this extremely short term, which is the COVID-19 situation, not only the links between the environment and COVID, the, the, the going uh, both ways between the pandemic and the environment, but also to keep an eye open to see if the extreme uh, effects on the economy resulting from the pandemic, if this leads to renewed calls for, oh, we can't afford to do environmental protection right now because of the economy, going back to that old, uh, I think, false dichotomy of uh, the uh, between the economy versus the environment. And hopefully that all parts of society will seize this moment to rebuild in a way that enables um, the economy to recover in a much greener way. So it'll be interesting to see and watch and hopefully be a part of influencing the recovery strategies and plans and to make sure that they are achieving, you know, economic justice as well as environmental sustainability going forward, as opposed to going back to the old model where one is seen as taking away from the other. Great points, Heather. And I think, um, I, I'm. I'm. This is where I'm going to uh, side with uh, Angela, who said, "Let's end on an optimistic note." Because I certainly, I certainly see, as you say, we're recording this in the time of COVID, the first summer that we've dealt with COVID. There might be another one, and uh, and uh, but all the talk that I'm certainly hearing, and not just through my environmental channels, but on mainstream media, on uh, how say the the Biden's upcoming government potentially in the states is going to look at uh, reconstruction post-COVID, how the European Union is thinking about it, how uh, the Canadian government is talking about green infrastructure as as an important part of economic recovery. I, I get a sense that, uh, that the sustainable development uh, discourse has become so deep in these institutions that we're going to see a different response uh, in this economic recovery than, say, even that what came after the 2008 financial crisis. Would you agree with that? Yes, I think we are hearing a lot of that from many leaders, and it'll be interesting also to follow uh, industry leaders and, and others um, as well, to have all of these voices connected. I think you're right. I, I, I mm -hmm. hope that I that you're all right, and I do tend to be more an optimist that uh, this will hopefully be a moment of great change in that direction. But I just think vigilance is always important. I, I fully agree. And uh, I want to thank you, Angela, for ending us with uh, starting us off on ending in an optimistic way. And uh, Heather, your, uh, your encouraging thoughts as well. And you've both given uh, the listeners to this podcast a lot to think about and, and some excellent context and some big picture thinking about what environmental law and policy looks like in Canada today, uh, some of the, the gaps, some of the things it doesn't do well, as well as some of the achievements. And, uh, and uh, you've pointed to lots of different resources and, and ideas that uh, students interested in this area could continue to pursue going forward. So this wraps up this episode of the Ecopolitics podcast. Don't forget to check out other episodes in the series at ecopoliticspodcast.ca. And please do send us your feedback on these episodes. We really appreciate hearing from our listeners. We'll also be sure to include both links to uh, what both of today's guests' websites on the Ecopolitics website so you can find out more about them and their important research. And so thank you to both of you, Heather and Angela. And uh, to our listeners, we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you.